So lecture four is all about food poisoning. And again, just to reiterate, uh, there are notes downloadable that you can use alongside this course. And you will need them, uh, especially for this section, the next section, where we look at bacterial names in detail. Uh, we look at the types of bacteria, what their growth requirements are, and questions will come up in the exam regarding specific bacteria. So just to give a little warning that it is again worth downloading the notes and using this alongside these lectures. So uh, the aim of this unit is to provide an understanding of the causes and effects of food poisoning and to clarify the specific and genetic controls required in order to prevent an outbreak of food poisoning. And the learning outcomes, by the end of this module, you will be able to identify the sources, food vehicles, incubation periods, symptoms and controls of common food poisoning organisms. Now, with all these learning outcomes, re these really are the potential questions uh, that you're going to get in the exam. So if you're just looking at that one, you'll need to be aware of the sources, the food vehicles, incubation periods, etc., of these common food poison organisms. There's only a handful, but still it's, it's a lot of information to take on board. Understand the role of management and environmental health practitioners, uh, what we used to call environmental health officers, in outbreak investigation. And state the different type of chemicals, poisons, uh, sorry, poisons, plants, metals, and fish that can cause serious problems in the food industry. Okay, let's kick off with the causes of food poisoning. We've got bacteria, or the toxins, which we covered uh, in the previous section. We've got chemicals. Uh, these can have acute or chronic effects. Uh, don't forget, acute is something that happens short term. Chronic could happen over a long period of time. Chronic, for example, could be a buildup of certain chemicals in human tissue that won't show any symptoms uh, for the first few years, but after a long period of time could start showing um, results. Uh, metals, poisonous plants, poisonous fish or shellfish, moulds, certain moulds uh, produce poisons called mycotoxins, myco relating to the uh, fungal part. Uh, bacterial food poisoning, let's have a look at a, a definition there. This is an acute, so short term, disturbance of the gastrointestinal tract resulting in abdominal pain with or without diarrhea and vomiting due to the consumption of food contaminated by poisoning bacteria or their toxins. Other definitions, a causative agent is or are the bacteria, toxin or poison that contaminates the food and causes illness. The food vehicle is the food consumed that contained the causative agent. So this could well be the high-risk food that's contaminated with Staphylococcus aureus. That is the food vehicle. That gets the bacteria into the uh, human body. So let's start off with some of the bacteria. Uh, so we have salmonella species. Uh, species uh, refers to the fact there's about 2,500 different types or serotypes. And this, uh, I'm going to mention whether it's uh, toxic or infectious. Infectious means it's due, the uh, food poisoning is due to the large numbers of bacteria consumed. So again, between 500,000 or a million uh, more likely, which you can fit on a pinhead, will cause food poisoning. And what happens is the immune system reacts to uh, these large number of bacteria by uh, sending off its um, immune system cells to the point of entry. And the symptoms of food poisoning then are caused by our immune system. So salmonella caused by um, large numbers being consumed. The incubation period is 6 to 72 hours typically 12 to 36. Duration, one to seven days. The symptoms, abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, fever, and occasional deaths. There are 2,500 plus serotypes. Uh, Salmonella enteritidis and Salmonella typhimurium are the most common. 
It's a facultative anaerobe, so it can live with or without oxygen. And the growth range is 7 to 45 degrees C, but the optimum temperature is human body temperature, 37 degrees C. Uh, it's gram-negative, it's rod-shaped, and millions are required. Again, all the information that's on this uh, page now, you will need to have a good understanding because they will ask you, uh, for example, they'll give you four bacteria names and they will ask you uh, which of these bacteria is a gram-negative rod-shaped bacterium where the optimum temperature ranges, or the optimum temperature is 30 centigrade C. Uh, because not all bacteria will have those similar sort of uh, results. So sources of salmonella include raw, raw meat, so we've got raw poultry, uh, eggs, uh, although not so much in eggs these days, um, as faecal contamination and Campylobacter. Uh, milk, meat from people, animals, rodents, and insects. The common food vehicles, how they um, get into, not rather get into food, but what food that we eat will contain salmonella, include cooked poultry, cooked meat, raw milk, and raw egg products. Control factors, make sure that animals' feed is heat treated, is sterilised, avoid overcrowding and transport stress, uh, give good segregation between animals. Hygienic slaughter of poultry and red meat. Other control factors with food. Avoid raw milk and raw egg products. Thorough thawing and cooking of frozen poultry. Good personal hygiene. Exclude ill people. Detection of carriers. Good premises design and good integrated pest management. Clostridium perfringens, perfringens, sorry, are again infectious, which means large numbers cause infection. Incubation period, eight to 22 hours, typically eight to 12. Duration of illness, 12 to 48 hours. Symptoms include abdominal pain, diarrhea, but vomiting is rare, so this bacteria or these bacteria affect the sort of bottom end of the body rather than the top end. Uh, it's anaerobic so it does not require oxygen. It's a spore former. We looked at spores earlier. Uh, the growth range is 10 to 52 degrees C although the optimum is 43 to 47 so quite high really for um, food poisoning pathogen. It's gram positive it's rod-shaped and millions are required. So the sources of Clostridium perfringens include people, animals, feces, sewage, soil, dust, insects, raw meat and raw poultry. Common food vehicles, stews, casseroles, rolled joints, and meat pies. Control factors, good separation and segregation, pre-prepared vegetables rather than raw vegetables with soil contamination, rapid cooling and refrigerated storage as soon as possible after cooking, good personal hygiene, the size of the joint uh, should be restricted to a maximum size of about 2.25 kilograms because we do get a lot of problems with large uh, joint sizes and clostridium perfringens and excellent cleaning and disinfection. Next one is Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, this is toxic so that means uh, the food poison is called by, caused by the toxin that comes from these bacteria not by the large numbers that are ingested. Staphylococcus aureus is if you like our bacteria it's on our bodies on our skin it's in our nose our mouth in our ears so we've got to be careful when we prepare food we wash our hands regularly don't cough or sneeze over food or near food 
The incubation period is one to seven hours and there's an exotoxin uh, produced in the food. Duration of the illness, six to 24 hours. Symptoms include abdominal pain, vomiting, prostration, but diarrhea is not common. So the, if you like this bacteria, that affect the, the top end of the body rather than the bottom end. It's a facultative anaerobe, so uh, can live with or without oxygen. It's salt tolerant. Uh, another word for that is a halophile. The growth range is 7 to 48 degrees C. The optimum temperature, 35 degrees C. So just a little under the uh, human 37 degrees C temperature. It's gram positive. It's a coccus shape, so it's round, it's like a globe. And it's a halophile. Uh, salt tolerant and as I've already mentioned the picture in the background that is Staphylococcus aureus under a microscope looking very much as it does like a bunch of grapes which is where Staphylococcus gets its name from. The sources of Staphylococcus aureus include people uh, from the nose, mouth, skin, from spots, boils, from raw milk. Common food vehicles, milk and dairy products, desserts, custards, cooked meats, cooked poultry, and prawns. So just think of the, the old high-risk high foods that uh, food handlers are prepared in. Control factors include good personal hygienic practices, hand washing, reducing handling of food, Exclusion of staff where they've got colds, boils or septic cuts. Avoiding raw milk. Refrigeration of high-risk food between 1 and 4 degrees C, preferably 3 or lower. And the use of waterproof dressings, uh, normally the blue uh, plasters in the first instant. Um, the blue really is to make sure it can be seen if it falls into food. But the main use of a waterproof dressing is to prevent microbiological contamination uh, going from the cut uh, into the food. Bacillus cereus. Again, this is another toxic one. So it produces a poison which causes the problem. Uh, not from the sheer numbers of bacteria that's ingested. Uh, this is known as the uh, rice poisoning bacteria. If you've ever had food poisoning after eating takeaway rice uh, or cooked rice yourself and didn't uh, cook it properly, uh, it could be this is the causative agent. The incubation period, uh, the two types, uh, so again something else to remember uh, just to uh, bombard you with more information. Uh, there's type 1 which is 1 to 6 hours and type 2 6 to 24 hours. So there's two types of toxins produced. The duration of the illness uh, from 12 to 24 hours for type 1, type 2, 1 to 2 days. Symptoms, type 1, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting and some diarrhea. Type 2, abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea and some vomiting. So in effect, type 1 uh, affects the top end of the body again, uh, right down to the sort of uh, small intestine or down to the stomach. Type 2 uh, affects everything then from the lower end of the uh, intestinal system, i.e. the small intestine down through the large intestine. So you can see there's more diarrhea in type 2 and more vomiting in type 1. It's a spore former. So as already mentioned, there are only two food safety bacterial families that produce spores. That's uh, bacilli and clostridia. Its heat uh, produces a heat-resistant enterotoxin. Uh, again, you can look this up, but it's a toxin that affects the gastrointestinal tract. Um, if you wanted to destroy this toxin, you must heat the food 126 degrees C for 90 minutes, which is nigh on impossible in an ordinary kitchen. Um, even you find that difficult in an autoclave. Uh, growth range is 5 to 48 degrees C. But the optimum temperature is just under uh, human body temperature again, 28 to 35 degrees C. It's gram positive. It's a rod-shaped uh, bacterium and millions are required. 
And what it is, the millions, uh, as they are growing, they produce a toxin. And it's the toxin that causes a problem more than the actual number of bacteria. Sources include cereals, especially rice, spices, corn flour, bean sprouts, soil and dust. Common food vehicles include reheated rice, corn flour products and food container spices. Control factors, cook and serve straight away. In other words, if you're cooking any rice products, uh, cook it and serve it hot. Hot hold above 63 degrees C because you'll find spores won't actually germinate um, unless uh, they're in the temperature danger zone, around about 37 degrees C. So when we uh, have got rice above 63 degrees C, there's no bacteria present, but there are spores present. Cool rapidly, so it doesn't give time for the spores to germinate. Uh, use refrigerator storage. Again, spores won't germinate uh, in a fridge. And thorough reheating before service. Uh, reheating to 75 degrees C is fine. Avoid cross-contamination and have good cleaning and disinfection schedules, including clean as you go. Clostridium botulinum. So we've already covered Clostridium perfringens. This is another serotype, Clostridium botulinum. And this again produces uh, a poison or toxin. So it's classed as toxic. Incubation period, usually 12 to 36 hours. Uh, where a neurotoxin is produced um, and this is quite a serious neurotoxin in fact apart from uh, puffer fish poisoning which also produces a neurotoxin this is probably the, one of the most virulent toxins um, known on the planet uh, can kill within two minutes what it does it uh, paralyzes the central nervous system so any messages from the brain uh, to other organs, for example, telling the heart to beat or the lungs to work, those messages are cut off, and so the body just closes down quite quickly. Duration, recovery may take months. Symptoms, uh, here we go, difficulty swallowing, slow recovery, blurred and double vision, muscle paralysis, diarrhea than constipation, and deaths are very common. It's an obligate anaerobe in other words doesn't require oxygen of any shape or form it's, it does uh, the, the exotoxin itself is heat sensitive so it can be destroyed through normal cooking it's a spore former growth range is 3 to 48 degrees C it's gram positive uh, it's a rod shape and type E clostridium botulinum is a cyclophile Sources include fish intestines, soil, vegetables. Common food vehicles, low acid processed food, canned and smoked fish, bottled vegetables, honey. Uh, in fact, it aids in something called infant botulism. Honey is a very natural product. It's not heat processed or preserved in any way, shape or form. And it can contain Clostridium botulinum spores which if you give to an infant, uh, that's anything under 12 months, any child under 12 months, uh, these spores can germinate uh, within the child's stomach, the infant's stomach, because the stomach hasn't really developed um, any uh, uh, sort of acid reaction yet. So the, the spores can germinate uh, and they can release then the poison, which will result in infant botulism. This is probably what you see on uh, containers of honey, do not feed to children under 12 months. Uh, this is the reason why. Control factors, time temperature control, vacuum packs, especially smoked fish, must always be kept under refrigeration. Discard any blown cans. These are cans of food that are bulging uh, because there might be a clostridium botulinum uh, growth within the can. Uh, the use of preservatives such as nitrates uh, will prevent growth of uh, clostridium thorough cooking destroys the toxin so anything above 63 degrees celsius up to 75 will kill the toxin 
Control factors, good manufacturing practice, for example, canning, bottling vegetables and fish and smoking the fish. Prevent cross-contamination, care in gutting and preparing raw fish. Um, prevent post-process post contamination. Vibrio parahemolyticus, bit of a mouthful. Um, remember that word because you will impress people if you say that. It's infectious, which means it's caused by the vast numbers of bacteria that, are, that cause the immune system to react. Incubation period, 2 to 96 hours, usually 12 to 18. Duration is 1 to 7 days. Symptoms include diarrhea, vomiting, fever, abdominal pain and dehydration. Again, it's, it's the, f the full um, raft of symptoms. So it affects the top and the bottom half of the body. Dehydration really is the, the loss of fluids because of the diarrhea and vomiting. And as I think I've already mentioned, di dehydration is the killer. It's a facultative anaerobe, so it can do with or without oxygen. Growth range, 8 to 44 degrees C. Optimum, around about body temperature. It's gram positive, it's comma shaped, and millions are required. Sources include faeces and sewage. The sewage is faeces. Common food vehicles, seafood, especially prawns. Um, or even prawns um, that are harvested from dirty waters or infected waters. Um, also things like shellfish, mussels, uh, clams or any other bivalves. If they grow in any contaminated water or um, in estuaries uh, where the rivers come up from large cities, um, you will find that that's going to be heavily contaminated uh, with sewage. Uh, one thing I, I don't think I've already mentioned, but in the UK and other countries throughout the world, there are sewage overflow pipes um, in every, every town or city. And when uh, there's uh, any storms or any floods, uh, the, the sewage systems can't uh, put up with the extra influx of water. So there's an overflow of sewage into the water supply. Uh, so it is a big problem. Not all sewage actually ends up in sewage farms. A lot of it ends up in, uh, into rivers, into estuaries, and eventually into the sea. So if you are looking at um, putting seafood on the menu, make sure you know uh, the provenance of the seafood, where it comes from, where it's grown, and make sure it's, it's not any, uh, anywhere near any industrialised areas. Control factors, do not consume raw shellfish. Uh, see, there's, there's a big problem there, you know, if you like oysters. Again, you need to know the provenance of your oyster, where it comes from, make sure it comes from clean water. Uh, cook well. Again, that's a problem when you use sort of moon marinade or other um, shellfish dishes. You don't really cook them well. You're only really uh, steaming them until the shell opens. And avoid cross-contamination. Uh, here's another one. Yersinia enterocolitica. Again, infectious, caused by the vast numbers ingested. Incubation period, one to five days usually 12 to 36 hours. Duration, one to seven days. Symptoms include diarrhea, fever, abdominal pain and dehydration. So this is one that affects mainly the lower half of the body. And again, dehydration from the loss of fluids because of uh, diarrhea. Again, it's a facultative anaerobe, can do with or without oxygen. Growth range is 0 to 44 degrees C, so quite a long growth range. Uh, the optimum is 28 to 30 degrees C, so just under human body temperature. But it's not common in the UK. Sources include milk, raw pork, meat and poultry, and shellfish and fish. Common food vehicles, raw milk and dairy products, meat, poultry, fish, shellfish, especially oysters, and salads. Control factors, good hygienic practice, avoid raw fish and milk, thorough cooking, avoid cross-contamination, good time and temperature control, 
Effective stock rotation, especially uh, under refrigeration. Common food vehicles, uh, poultry, which is undercooked. Cooked meat and meat products, desserts, shellfish and fish, salad vegetables and fruit. Um, it's usually classed as a uh, viral infection. Egg products and eggs. Milk and milk products. And that's the um, last of the food poisoning bacteria. So quite a lot of information given there. As I say, use the notes that have been provided uh, to read up on them a bit more before the exam. Uh, 10 main causal factors of food poisoning. These are the top 10. Uh, and these seem to be the top 10 every year, no matter uh, when they are taken. Uh, the first one, number one on the hit parade, if you like, is preparation too far in advance and storage at ambient temperature. This is, gives rise to multiplication of bacteria within the food. Inadequate cooling, so again, gives rise to multiplication. Inadequate reheating, so you get survival of bacteria. Contaminated process and canned food, so inherent contamination. Undercooking, again, survival. Inadequate thawing, survival during cooking. Cross-contamination, again causing contamination. Raw food consumed, inherent contamination. Improper warm holding, where you'll get multiplication. And infected food handlers, uh, leading to contamination of the food product and therefore food poisoning. So food poisoning management failures. Uh, there's no risk assessment on menu change. No contingency planning, poor communication between management and frontline staff, management disincentives, cost cutting on equipment, failure to recognise hazards, failure to learn from earlier errors, poor design, unrealistic demands on junior management or untrained staff, uh, including supervisory staff, absence of routine planning and consistent procedures. So how do we prevent bacteriological food poisoning? Effective management. HACCP is a, is a good uh, food safety management system, which well must be implemented by law. Effective time and temperature control. Heat processing and cooking to the correct temperatures. Preventing contamination through looking at the food safety chain and making sure, using HACCP, uh, that every link in the chain is uh, is sturdy and no contamination can get into the food product. Good personal hygiene practices. An effective exclusion policy. Good training, supervision and instruction. Avoiding raw foods. Using approved and reputable suppliers. Having a good, effective cleaning and disinfection uh, management system a good integrated pest management system and a good waste management system. Non-bacterial food poisoning include things like chemicals. Uh, this can come from fungicides, weed killers, pesticides, cleaning chemicals and additives, etc. Metals such as antimony, cadmium, copper, iron, lead, mercury, tin, zinc, etc. Plants such as deadly nightshade, uh, death cap fungi, daffodil bulbs, toadstools, rhubarb leaves, etc. Fish or shellfish, uh, you can get things called scrombrotoxin coming from fish and shellfish, and something called paralytic shellfish poisoning. Moulds, uh, this has been mentioned once or twice before, uh, comes from mycotoxins which are the fungal toxins produced in certain foods, uh, such as nuts, for example, peanuts, and apple juice. Um, the examples of the toxins include ochratoxin, patilin, and aflatoxin. Now, just to put your mind at rest, these are not the, the sort of blue-green moulds that you see on bread or on cheese. Uh, these are really specialised moulds that you'll only find on these certain foods under certain conditions of growth. So chemicals uh, could be an incorrect additive, 
excess of additive or cleaning chemicals. Uh, could be due to commercial greed. There's been several examples of that uh, over the years. Uh, I remember one going back in the 80s where uh, engine oil that had been taken out of uh, vehicles uh, was filtered and used as extra virgin olive oil and actually sold to the public. Quite a few people died from that. Uh, pesticides and insecticides actually getting into the food. Um, packaging uh, or le leaching of certain plastic packaging, uh, the chemicals from that packaging get into food. Poison from metals. Acid food should not be stored or cooked in equipment containing any of the following metals. Antimony, cadmium, copper, lead, tin, iron, zinc, aluminium. Um, that is a bit of a bummer really with aluminium because these are the main, well this is the main metal in the indicator industry we use our pots and pans made of. Uh, it's got good thermal properties, it's light, um, it's very robust. Um, but really this only uh, affects acid fruits. If you cook the acid fruits in any of these metals, uh, you will get um, metallic ions as we call them, as I-O-N-S. Uh, coming from the metal into the fruit itself. Um, aluminium is probably not going to hurt you, but you will get a metallic taint, and that is illegal. So you are breaking the law by doing that. Uh, some of the other uh, metals might give rise to uh, chronic effects, so uh, poison over time, such as antimony, cadmium, and lead. The following metals have also caused problems in food, mercury and chromium, uh, especially with mercury which has been found in fish, uh, which really inhabit um, coastlines around uh, mining communities. Uh, there was a big problem, and might still be a problem down in Cornwall where uh, tin mining used to be the um, one of the biggest industries, but with tin mining it does release mercury into the water. Uh, this then is taken up by the fish and it goes into their body tissues. Then it enters the food chain when we eat the fish. Uh, dangerous plants include toadstools, uh, belladonna, rhubarb leaves, red kidney beans, which should be boiled vigorously if they're dried for at least 15 minutes before use. Almonds contain uh, prussic acid. Uh, which is the precursor of cyanide. And potatoes, uh, green or sprouting, should not be used. Fish and shellfish poisoning. Uh, different types of poison. One is called scrombo scombrotoxin. Uh, this can affect uh, macro tuna, pilchers and sardines. Uh, it's where histidine is turned to histamine uh, and it survives the canning process. Um, it can result uh, from using spoilt fish. Never spoil your fish, folks. Always treat them um, the same as any other fish. Um, there's a short onset of uh, this toxic poisoning. It causes burning, rash, swelling, nausea, diarrhea and vomiting. Fish or shellfish poisoning. Uh, there's another one called paralytic shellfish poisoning. Very rare. It's where bivalves, um, things like mussels, uh, clams, uh, scallops, etc., feed on poisonous plankton. Toxin may survive cooking. There's a tingling and numbness of tongue, neck, arms and legs. The onset is 30 minutes to 12 hours. Now, we don't normally get poisonous plankton um, in our water unless it's what's called in the sea a red flush or whether the, war, uh, the weather's been extremely warm during the summer, where you get a flush of plankton that is poisonous. Another one is diuretic shellfish poisoning, or DSP. Uh, another one is uh, where pufferfish has been eaten and uh, the neurotoxin that's present there has been ingested. Cigatera, red whelk. All different types of fish and shellfish poisoning. Uh, most of those, the, the top four there, are uh, very rare in the UK.
Outbreak investigation. So the aim of an outbreak investigation of food poisoning. Uh, you've got aims, objectives. You've got a fo food poisoning outbreak control team. Environmental health practitioners are involved. Uh, there'll be a consultant in communicable, communicable disease control, CCDC, and uh, the Health Protection Agency. Uh, these are all the things that must be put into place um, when there is an outbreak investigation. So the role of management uh, during a food poisoning and outbreak is to advise staff, suspend sales, remove and isolate any of the food, exclude staff, take specimens, uh, ill staff uh, must be um, told to the investigating team who they are, any of the foods have been implicated, uh, what complaints have been made, what is the food history, uh, any sampling needs to be taken as well, monitoring records, clean and disinfect, arrange for restock and answer questions. All these things uh, is the role of management during the outbreak investigation. Uh, the sampling, for example. Uh, sampling really should be taken uh, of your food products on a daily basis anyway, but um, this sometimes proves too onerous and has over the last um, number of years. This is why HACCP now has been introduced into food premises um, so that the HACCP records should show that um, all um, reasonable precautions have uh, been taken in order to prevent uh, food poisoning. That is called your due diligence. So the role of the environmental health practitioner, there are six key stages in the investigation. There are preliminaries, case finding, site investigation, intermediate review, source tracing and consolidation. And again, look at the notes that have been provided for more details of the six key stages. So, the key points for this lecture. Uh, bacteria are the most common cause of food poisoning. We found out that. We um, looked at the sources, the food vehicles, the incubation period, symptoms and controls of common food poisoning organisms. We looked at chemicals, metals, poisonous plants and fish and see how they can cause serious problems in the food industry. We looked at spores and toxins <coughs> and found that some are heat resistant. And we looked at the role of management and EHPs in outbreak investigation. Again, just to reiterate, look at your notes for more information on outbreak investigation.